problem with this being recorded, maybe speak up now or put something on Slack. Are we allowed to swear? <laughs> you can swear all you want. <laughs> we, so the agreement I've got with Adam is we'll record this thing and then we both parties, Quark and Adam, have to agree afterwards if anyone wants to use it for anything in particular. Um, but, you know, we're probably both cool with it on both sides. So um, uh, we've got 37 people. I'd like to welcome the, the newbies to the beginner course. There's also some people from the CW class, such as Maureen, VE3MIO, who was just awarded the Gray Bruce Amateur of the Year by the Gray Bruce Amateur Radio Club. Congratulations, Maureen. Um, and there may be some other people joining us. So I'd like to say welcome to Adam. I'm so happy that Adam Kimmerly decided to accept our invitation to speak. Um, Dave Lawn posted a, one of your videos, the video where you do the nine to one Anan on our Slack channel and said, look at this guy, like I wonder if I could make this little thing. And you know, a bunch of us got watching your YouTube channel, K6ARK Portable Radio. And um, I kind of feel like I got to know you watching it. You know, your enthusiasm for outdoor activities, hiking and fishing and mountaineering. And I saw some mention of mountain rescue somewhere in your past and the lightweight rigs and the lightweight antennas and the home brewing and like just your, your excitement about it, like the video that says it's fun even when it isn't fun. You know, <laughs> just, and a bunch of us are um, getting portable rigs, QRP rigs, going out in the backyard. We're not quite venturing to parks maybe yet, although some of us have a little bit. Uh, there's not a lot of summits around here, but your enthusiasm for this stuff is so infectious and like, please infect us. Awesome. You. Well, that is certainly my goal. And, uh, you know, I, I got to say a uh, hundred years in your, with your club and 37 people here tonight, you, uh, you, you have a very active community there. And I think that's really awesome. So congratulations on, on fostering that amongst yourselves and building that foundation for, uh, for an awesome amateur radio community. So that's, that's really cool. And, uh, and thank you for the, the warm welcome. Um, as Vic mentioned, my name is Adam. Um, I'm a mechanical engineer by degree, which adds some challenge for me to uh, the ham radio stuff, uh, but I fumble my way through it and, and have learned enough. I work in industrial quality and in my spare time, I do quite a wide range of outdoor activities from trail running, mountain biking, mountaineering, fishing, and as Vic mentioned, search and rescue as well. And um, that's really kind of how I got started in amateur radio and uh, what eventually led me to start making videos about my adventures. So let me go ahead and hit the screen share here. Let's see, that should work. All right, it usually has a little bit of a lag, but it should show up there. So let me know when you're able to see that. Cool. So that photo is uh, kind of a humorous uh, QSL card that I put together <laughs> from uh, a photo my sister took of me on a, a local mountaintop here. And uh, she was bored as I was sitting there tapping away at some CW on uh, the mountain topper and took a picture of me with my loop antenna. And uh, being the graphic designer that she is, she decided to Photoshop um, a bobcat jumping through the loop antenna and then uh, proceeded to set it on fire <laughs> with, uh, with some flames. So that became my, uh, my QSL card for a while. And Although I live in San Diego, we do have some decent mountains nearby. And uh, yes, it was about 22 degrees C here today. So um, nice, uh, nice cool day for us. 
Um, but uh, over the weekend, I did get to spend some time up in the snow on a local summit at about uh, 2,200 meters elevation and uh, played in winter field day up there. So it was, it was quite a blast. Um, this was my view for sunrise in the morning. Really quite a beautiful place there. And as I mentioned, um, a, a big part of my life is search and rescue. It's a, it's a volunteer activity down here. I've been part of the San Diego Mountain Rescue Team since 2005, so about 15 years, a little over 15 years now. And that's what fostered my interest in amateur radio. We used you know, analog VHF and UHF handhelds for team communication. And I just, I wanted to learn more about how the radios worked. So in 2010, I got my technician class license. And then a few years later, I upgraded to general class. And then about a year after that, upgraded to, um, to a uh, extra class license. And pretty soon after I got into HF, uh, or we got the extra class and general and extra class licenses, I picked up a Yesu FT817 and began doing some summits on the air activity. So I would cram that two, two and a half pound brick of a radio into a running pack and go run through the mountains on the trails with, uh, oh, an LNR precision uh, NFED half wave antenna and set that up on a summit and play radio for a bit and had a blast. And um, after doing that for a little while, uh, I, I got more uh, excited about summits on the air activity through watching YouTube videos from uh, a guy by the, by the name of Steve uh, with the call sign WG0AT who has some fantastic videos uh, of him and his goats. He put some wonderful humor in those things where the goats would have little thought bubbles and they'd be thinking and saying silly things to him and chewing up his, his log and <laughs> running into his antenna wires. And I thought, you know, I want to do what Steve does. I want to take uh, some video and capture my adventures and share them with other people and get people as excited about doing that kind of stuff as he did for me. So that's why I have my channel at this point. Um, and it's, it's grown a lot over the last year. Um, I think uh, about this time last year, I had maybe five or 600 people subscribe to it. And now I have nearly 6,000 people subscribe to it. So it's, uh, it's, it's grown quite a bit. And I really should throw a shout out to um, the other ham radio YouTubers, um, the community that we have. We have a Slack or a Discord group actually, uh, where we we uh, coordinate efforts, and they have been nothing but uh, supportive. So, a pretty cool community there. So, um, after operating with that uh, FT817 for a while, I uh, learned. CW or learn Morse code so I could operate CW from summits because the radios are much smaller. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the, uh, the mountain topper rigs, but uh, this station or this rig is about the size of a deck of cards, puts out five watts on 20, 30, and 40 meters. And um, the whole station that I use with, with this rig weighs about 12 ounces, um, and that includes the antenna. Uh, if I throw in a, a telescopic pole, it adds another seven or eight ounces. So um, very awesome little station. You can see a photo of the antenna here. This is one of my earlier builds before I came up with the, the idea to build the, the, the uh, matching unit right onto the BNC connector. But um, still 30 gauge wire, some miniature traps and a 350 milliamp hour uh, three series lipo cell that lasts about two hours with this radio. It's so power efficient. And then sometimes I want to run a little bit more power on a summit. So uh, this is the station for that. This is a Yesu FT857 with a 12 amp hour uh, bio -NO lithium iron phosphate battery. And that allows me to run 100 watts out of this rig uh, for generally about three to four hours, depending on the duty cycle, plus or minus a bit there. 
And then finally, uh, my other favorite rig, the Elecraft KX2. These are just ridiculously capable little radios. And with that, uh, when paired up with that nine to one un -un antenna on the BNC connector and uh, 17 foot counterpoise and 41 foot radiator of, of 30 gauge wire, it's, you know, you can work 80 to, uh, 80 to 10 meters with the push of a button. So uh, pretty incredible little station. And this one I think weighs about, oh, um, just a little over a pound, I believe. I forget the exact weight on this one. So let's see here. Any questions about any of the, the rigs at this point or anything that I've, I've talked about thus far? Can you describe that antenna in a little bit more detail, Adam? Yeah, I will. So um, let's see, I'll, I'll talk about those. I'll, I've got some photos of, of antennas in a little bit. So I'll, I'll dive more into the details of those antennas in, in a few minutes here. Let's see, I've lost my mouse cursor. There we go. <laughs> so um, for portable operations, uh, you know, going from extreme QRP to what I call QRO, for me, 100 watts portable is QRO. Um, I've got a variety of batteries that I use for that, ranging from the tiny 350 milliamp hour battery all the way up to a 60 amp hour uh, lithium iron phosphate 12 volt cell that will, you know, easily last a weekend running 100 watts. Um, and then everything in between. So, um, my, my goal here is just to show that there are, there are a lot of portable power options out there. And um, these days, the, uh, the lithium iron phosphate cells, although they cost a bit more, they are certainly worth, uh, worth the money in what you get out of them and their lighter weight and how long they last. Um, some people might say that I have a problem with acquiring telescopic poles. Uh, I, I'm not sure I see any problems here. I, I think I've got one for just about every use. <laughs> so, um, and, and in all honesty, these all do have, have different applications. Uh, they range in length from 31 feet for the orange poles on the left, um, a couple of 20-ish uh, 20, 20 footers in the middle. And then the ones where you see sets of four those are ones that I specifically use for portable Yagis or portable beam antennas for HF that I've been, uh, been working on. In addition to wire antennas, I've experimented a bit with uh, small transmitting loop antennas. This is uh, a particular model that I designed and built for the Mountain Topper MTR3B. And it's made out of uh, bar stock aluminum, half inch by I think 1 16th inch, cut into a number of sections and uh, bolted together with uh, stainless steel hardware. And the feed point at the bottom, I'll show a photo of that here in a second, but that whole unit folds up accordion style into about a one foot long section and it weighs about nine ounces. And, uh, it sits right on the end of an upside down trekking pole, just a, a hiking stick. So I don't have to carry any extra supports. Uh, I don't have to carry a, a mast to hold up, hold up say a, a piece of coax as the radiating element for that antenna. And it's obviously an incredible small, incredibly small and doesn't require much space to set up in perhaps a, an area with a lot of brush or uh, just a small summit area. The, the tuning, box on it. Well, let's see. I'll show you the match first. The, um, the match is, this, I think this is considered a gamma match, um, but uh, that's just an alligator clip that attaches to, to the aluminum. And I, I do my best to get a little bit of the aluminum oxide off and make a decent connection there because uh, with the, uh, the voltage and, and currents that flow in these small transmitting loop antennas, any resistance that you have uh, provides kind of significant losses. But uh, that said, this antenna does work on 20, 30, and 40 meters. Um, this is my uh, tuning capacitor for it. And my strategy for the build on this was to use a small air 
variable capacitor as the, the fine tuning and then switched fixed capacitors to change bands. And I've got a three position switch that uh, allows me to operate 20, 30, and 40 meters with this. Um, and it, it works fairly well. It's obviously not very efficient on 40, um, but works decently on, uh, on the, the slightly higher bands. The, the worst part of it is just that it, just like any uh, magnetic loop or small transmitting loop antenna, it's very fidgety to tune because it's so high Q and has such a narrow bandwidth. So um, I don't end up using it a lot. I use the wire antennas much more. Any, uh, any questions on that, that loop antenna before I move on? What, uh, what stops the whole thing? Did you just tighten the nuts and bolts on it to stop the whole thing from kind of collapsing in on itself when it's actually in use? Yeah, exactly. Okay. So they're, they're nylock nuts. So there's just enough tension there and, and washers in between to allow the, the pieces to slide and, and not just, you know, gall the aluminum together. Um, but uh, it, it, uh, it actually, it folds and unfolds fairly well. And then I've got a, a little wing nut um, that I can release to, to let it open up and then just accordion fold it back into the, the closed position, so. Yeah, I would encourage I would encourage anyone to to build and experiment with uh, small transmitting loop antennas. They're actually quite easy to build. Uh, there's not a lot to them, especially for for lower power levels. When you get up to higher power levels, there's so much voltage in that capacitor that you really need like a vacuum variable, and things get more complex. So uh, this is um, a model from MMANA. Uh, the antenna modeling software that I use for an antenna that I refer to as a double bobtail. Um, how many of you are familiar with a bobtail curtain antenna? I see a few hands there. So um, a bobtail curtain antenna is a vertically polarized antenna. It's, it's basically um, a, a single bobtail curtain is basically three phased vertical quarter wave antennas. But instead of being right side up, they're upside down. So the ground plane connects the top. So if you imagine a capital letter E, let's see, no, that way for you guys, <laughs> and then rotate it so the legs point down. Uh, each leg is a quarter wave length long on the band of choice. And the wire that connects them across the top between each element is half of a wavelength. So what you end up with if you, if you make one of those is, is basically three in phase inverted ground plane vertical antennas. So what does that give you? Well, a single one of those gives you a relatively low angle of radiation broadside to the antenna and a bit of gain. Um, if you stack another one behind it, roughly, let's see, in this case, um, Oh, a quarter of a wavelength or so, a little less than a quarter of a wavelength. Um, it acts as sort of a reflector, just like a, it would in a Yagi. Even if it's the same, uh, same dimensions, it, it still gives you a, a directionality out of it and gives you pretty solid gain with a relatively low angle of radiation. And the, uh, the end result is actually a, a decently performing uh, portable DX antenna. The, the drawback to it is that it requires four poles to set up. So you remember back to my photo of all those piles of poles, they have a purpose. So um, this is the, uh, the, the thumbnail image that I put together for the video. And I would encourage you to go, uh, I'll put the link to my, my YouTube channel in the, ch in the chat page there, or if you just search K6ARK, you'll easily find my channel there. Um, I brought this antenna up to a summit. Actually, this is the same summit that I was on in that first photo that was covered in snow, uh, but earlier in the year before there was any snow up there. And um, I was able to, from, from Southern California, I was able to make a single sideband voice contact with 100 watts to a friend in Australia. I'm sorry, uh, new, uh, no, he is in, he's in Tasmania. So he's in Australia, VK7HH. Um, he was also running 100 watts and just using an NFED half wave antenna uh, out of his house. So 
not, not a special station on his end and uh, on 15 meters at the optimal time of day when uh, you know the propagation prediction said we had the best chance we were able to, to make the contact. So pretty cool, uh, pretty cool adventure up there. Let's see here. So any, any other questions on that antenna? So you, you can actually take a, a bobtail antenna and make it a little bit simpler and only build it with two legs. Um, you don't need the extra reflector. If you just build it with two legs, uh, kind of like a, a U, you end up with um, uh, what's called a half square. Uh, I, I don't know why they uh, gave it a completely different name, but the half square antenna has just slightly less, it's only I think about a dB less broadside gain and similar angle of radiation to the bobtail. So I, I built a half square for 20 meters and spent the night on a, a local soda summit working CW and single sideband. And that is the map of my 136 contacts that I made in about six to eight hours of operation. It was pretty amazing. And that was all on, on 20 meters. So um, one so of the cool things, yeah, go ahead. Where are you feeding the, the bobtail and the mm. square? Good question, and, and I meant to, to note that on, so I feed them actually differently. Um, you, you have a couple of options in how you feed these antennas. Um, it, you can feed the, the bobtail at the upper center, uh, basically at where the, the center vertical leg attaches to the horizontal wire, and you get a 50 ohm match there. Um, or you can feed it at the end, the bottom end of the, the center vertical element, and it's a high impedance match, similar to like an end fed half wave. So that's what I do with the bobtail curtain um, because uh, I don't wanna deal with a fifth pole to support that center and that coax, and I don't want that coax getting in the way of my radiation pattern um, on the double bobtail. So I feed it high impedance style with a uh, oh, roughly 49 to one uh, matching unit that I, I just built and, and then set up the antenna and tweaked and tuned uh, to get as best of a match as I could. And while I'm on that note, um, that's I think a really useful tip for any of you that are interested in building end fed half wave antennas. When you build that matching unit, before you permanently solder, or if in my case, like I do uh, glue or pot the whole assembly into place, test your impedance and look at your, um, look at your, your impedance uh, to see if you're above or below 50 ohms with that kind of starting point of, of turns ratio. And if you're under 50 ohms, if you're say 35 ohms, if you remove a, a turn or two or three from that secondary winding on your, your transformer, you can bring that into pretty much perfect match on your band of choice. The higher bands are gonna require a little less transformance ratio, lower bands are gonna require a little more. So now back to your other part of the question, the half square. I feed the half square antenna at an upper corner um, it's relatively easy to, to do that, um, and I, I, I don't know, I, when it's, excuse me, when it's possible to do so, um, I just want all the efficiency I can get out of the antenna and minimize any potential losses with the, you know, the matching unit um, and also the, um, just the variances you get by, by feeding at a, at a high voltage, low current point like that, so. All right, so this was uh, another antenna featured in a recent video. Um, this is on a, a SOTA summit. Uh, SOTA stands for summits on the air, if uh, anyone's not familiar with that term. Um, this is on a local summit, uh, maybe five miles from my house here. And this was during the ARRL 10 meter contest. Uh, this is a four element 10 meter wire beam. And the wire, I know it's a little hard to see the wire in there. It's I think 22 gauge wire <laughs> strung up there, maybe 26. I can't remember what I used. Um, but uh, 
This is uh, basically a giant X, slightly compressed, so it's longer than it is wide. And um, it, uh, it um, let's see, so the, there's a piece of cord going all the way around the outside of the antenna um, that supports the wires for the beam. And uh, the, the total boom length on this is essentially 28 feet long and it's about 16 feet across. Um, I did a little bit of modeling after this and figured out that I, I can actually squeeze another element in here and make it a five element and get a better pattern. <laughs> so I'll probably do that at some point. But um, uh, the thing worked quite well. Uh, there's also actually a small 12 volt rotator up there. So I can turn and point this thing uh, with just a, a cheap you know, $10, 12 volt geared motor with a pulley drive onto the, the shaft of the, the antenna. Um, now, it's, uh, it's certainly a fair weather antenna. It does not handle high winds. <laughs> it's made to be lightweight and portable. Um, I think the whole thing weighs about five pounds or so. So it's, it's quite light and very packable. Um, Let's see. But yeah, it was it was a blast in that 10 meter contest. And there is also a video of that adventure on uh, on my YouTube channel there. Any questions on on that antenna? How long does it take you to uh, to put that together when uh, like so you've been hiking all day and, and then you're going to get this out of your pack? How long does it take to set up? Yeah, good question. This one certainly takes a bit more time to set up than the others. Right. So um, uh, I would estimate this one I could probably set up in probably 20 minutes or so. Um, that would be, uh, I think, a pretty good estimate for, for setup time on this. It's actually not too bad. The, um, the, the, the mast is just a, a telescopic pool cleaning pole. Um, I've got a PC, PVC hub on there to attach the guy lines to, um, to guy the pole out. Uh, there's a, a PVC center section and then a, a couple pieces of steel fence post, uh, I'm sorry, steel um, chain link fence top rail that I cut, notched, and welded into the X, which is the steel hub for the, um, the, the four 16-foot poles that extend, uh, you know, act as spreaders to, to hold the wires out. Um, so that, that was... Uh, really quite a fun build. There, there's also a small uh, pole, one of my older ultralight poles that I broke the tip off of. I'm repurposing for uh, a center support um, to give me kind of a, a high point at the center to attach wires that go out to the tips of the poles to keep them from sagging too much from the weight of the wires. So but yeah, it's, it's, it's a really fun little antenna, <laughs> a big antenna, I should say. <laughs> So these are uh, my three most commonly used uh, wire antennas for summits on the air. Um, on the left is about 30 feet of RG174 coax, uh, a small uh, common mode choke near the end there. And then on the black winder next to it, uh, a 15 through 40 meter linked dipole. And that's my go-to antenna when I want to run full power, 100 watts from a summit. Uh, it's just, the, the dipole just is, is easier to manage um, and still be able to run that full power without having to have concerns of either a tuner for a random wire or um, a, a matching unit and the quirks that go along with an end-fed antenna while you're running higher power like that. The middle antenna uh, with the black wire is the, the one that was mentioned earlier, the nine to one random wire. It's a dash 50 size toroid. Um, I've found that for this type of build, the FT60 dash, uh, I'm sorry, FT50 dash 60, was it 61 mix um, works quite well for this random wire. Um, that said, I've used the 61 mix for larger ones and had less success. So, um, so it, it seems to vary on, on size and build and proximity to that BNC connector. And then, of course, the one on the far right is my uh, trapped end fed half wave that I, I use regularly with that mountaintopper MTR3B. 
And um, I actually, had, I did a presentation for uh, another group on Zoom about these antennas and recorded that and that video uh, with a whole bunch of detail about each of the, these antennas, pros and cons of each, and why I use each one uh, on my YouTube channel as well. So here, here's a close-up view of those nine to one uh, un unmatching units built onto BNC connectors. And uh, so when I started doing summits on the air activity and was looking for a good small portable antenna, I came across the, the PAR end feds, then LNR Precision now, uh, who, who sells them now? Uh, Viraplex, I think sells the antennas now. The end fed trail friendly antenna. It's 26 gauge poly stealth, nice quality um, wire. It's got a, a coil on it to, to make it uh, work on uh, 20, 40, 20, uh, 40, 20 and 10 meters. And it's got a nice small you know, plastic uh, matching unit box on the end of the antenna. And I thought, you know, I, I didn't want to buy a commercial antenna. I, I uh, had been building some dipoles and stuff. And I was like, you know what? I'm never going to be able to build an antenna that's as compact and awesome as this thing. So, so I bought that LNR antenna and I used that thing for years. And uh, eventually after tons of tinkering and, and messing with antenna builds, I came up with this idea. Uh, I had a BNC connector in my hand uh, for a coax, you know, attachment, and I had one of those FT50-43 toroids. I was like, "Hey, these things like really nest together really well. I wonder if I could build this thing onto the BNC connector." So I tried it, and it worked. <laughs> I started out with the NFED half wave antenna, and then I. Uh, decided to try to build one with the uh, the a nine to one matching unit for a random wire and it worked uh, similarly uh, as good I, I was really happy with the results the the drawback on these things of course is the difficulty of build you know these are really small toroids they're tricky to wind and they're even more tricky to to solder together and to get all the pieces in the right places so um, a friend of mine, N7MCB, came up with this idea to use a PCB mount BNC connector and build a small PCB that has all the appropriate attach points to build these antennas and make the build much easier. And you can see from the photos that it just it makes it that much easier to solder these things together and it actually makes for uh, really a, a more solid final unit so so i've actually purchased um a whole bunch of these these pcbs and uh as soon as i i finish kind of getting instructions together i'm going to start selling some kits for these at a, a very reasonable price for for people that want to build them um, Really, my goal with with sharing all this stuff and, and sharing these ideas on on YouTube was to just get people to build stuff and experiment and have fun like I am and learn about antennas like I have. I'm by no means an expert, uh, but I've learned a few things that work, and uh, I do everything I can to to share those. So, any any other questions about these antennas? Go ahead. Do you have? I assume somewhere you have some. Uh diagrams of how the, the wiring of this actually works and how it gets its structural strength and everything. I kind of imagine you have to be breaking either the shield or the core of the coax and losing a lot of structural strength somewhere to feed around this, or have I missed something? How does it work? Um, so th this doesn't attach, I, I actually use these antennas without coax. So this, I, I use them by attaching them directly to the radio. Uh, so so this, is, this is actually the matching unit and the only thing that attaches to the, the far side of this away from the, the BNC connector is just in, a, in the half wave antenna is the half wavelength radiating piece of wire. Or in the case of the, let's see, I'll go back to the, the nine to one. So you can see the, um, the one on the upper right here that has the, uh, the counterpoise, the ground wire coming off the side. 
and then the uh, radiating wire coming out the center. So, um, I see. and then the, yeah, and then the one on the bottom right, the RCA jack connector is, um, is just the half wave version. So it's only got the one radiating wire. Now, um, I know a lot of people build end fed half waves with a counterpoise. Um, the the AA5TB experiments and website uh, kind of point to a roughly 1 20th wavelength counterpoise. And, you know, I, I've experimented with that a bit and I have not found in, in my uses that it really makes any difference. Um, I've generally found that if, if I tune the matching unit optimally for um, the way I'm going to be using it, you know, how close to the ground I am, uh, whether I'm planning to be sitting on the ground when I'm operating um, uh, and get that matching unit optimally tuned for a 50 ohm match on the, the bands or center of the bands, at least that I want to use, it works quite well, even without the counterpoise um, with just me coupling, you know, capacitively coupling to the radio and the radio and me coupling to the ground acting as the counterpoise with with five watts, I, I've never had any kind of issue with RF coming back at me and, and you know, biting me in the fingers. So, um, so it, it certainly seems to work. Adam, when you um, test this in your backyard and get it tuned up, does it work about the same when you get up on a mountain? It does, yeah. Um, the the biggest i would say the the biggest difference is generally on the lower bands um and depending on how high off the ground i get it and that i think that is pretty consistent with really any antenna you know a, a 40 meter antenna um 40 meter dipole or half wave they radiate the same um when they're say you know just three to five meters off the ground they act electrically longer than, um, you know, than, than they are when they're 30 feet in the air. So um, if I'm on a mountaintop where I've got terrain that drops away pretty good all around, it, it acts like it's higher above ground and sometimes it'll mess with my, my tuning a little bit. But um, with, with many of them, I'll, I'll just fold back a little bit of wire at the end and give me some room to work to, to be able to manually tune it in the field. And even in that little mountain topper, I've actually, <laughs> I, I like modifying things. Um, I, I built a, um, excuse me, tiny SWR meter, little four LED model and drilled some holes and crammed it inside that radio. So I, I actually have a, an SWR meter even in that little mountain topper, which is quite handy. So let's see here. So in addition to uh, those fun little, um, uh, antenna matching units, I figured, well, you know, pulling the antenna down and, and changing out uh, some links to change bands is kind of a pain. I want to be able to just flip the switch on the radio and go from 20 to 30 to 40 and, and chase all those, uh, <laughs> those other summit stations that are, I see spots popping up for. So, um, so I came up with this idea to make these tiny little traps. And uh, this is a FT37-2 toroid um, and there's a small uh, surface mount capacitor in the middle of it on the PCB there and the holes on the PCB act as strain relief for the wire that uh, gets uh, soldered on and stuck through those holes and um, uh, while these things are extremely finicky to tune um, <laughs> they uh, once you get it just right they actually work really well and um, it makes for an incredibly small, compact, uh, and fantastic uh, pocket portable antenna. A um, couple notes on these. Uh, tuning these, uh, one of the things I learned, especially with these, is that some epoxies that I'm using as potting compounds have more of an impact than others on the tuning for these. So beware. <laughs> you will likely have to build multiple of these to, to figure out just that right sweet spot and where to set your tuning off a little bit before you put that epoxy potting compound in there to, to get the final final product. But uh, once you get it just right, they last a while and, and they work great. Any questions on the traps? Cool. 
Can you so, maybe explain a little bit of the theory of the traps, what they're doing for members who aren't familiar with that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think I, I think I talk about it a little bit in the video too. So I, I'd suggest checking that out. But um, the, the way my mechanical engineering brain makes sense of it is that um, the, the trap is a, a parallel LC circuit. There's an inductor and a capacitor in parallel. And when you put an inductor and a capacitor in parallel, they are resonant on a certain frequency. Um, so uh, you figure out what that frequency is going to be based on the values of the components. And, and uh, um, in the video, I kind of explain my, my thought process on, on how I figure out how many turns to use on the toroid using calculators and such. At any rate, where, where that LC circuit is resonant, um, if you feed resonant RF into one side of it, it acts as a high impedance point, and it, it's kind of just a roadblock for RF there. So um, the RF on that frequency doesn't really see anything past that trap, regardless of what's there. It's just, it's, it stops it. On every other frequency, uh, you end up primarily with some uh, inductive loading uh, for, for that wire. And that coil acts essentially as a loading coil um, to, to uh, physically shorten the antenna or electrically lengthen the antenna. So uh, what you end up with when you put a trap in a wire is rather than 66 feet of wire for a 40 meter antenna, when you've got a trap at the 20 meter point, you end up with say, um, oh, 55 feet or so, 50, you know, say 50 to 60 feet, depending on uh, the inductance in, in that trap there. So, um, so yeah, that LC circuit just acts as a, a high impedance point in that wire on the resonant frequency. And um, I don't doubt that there are others on the, on the Zoom that, that know traps really well. So if anyone has a, a comment to add to that, uh, go ahead. I have another question. Yeah, is, go ahead. Um, in one of your videos, and I forget if it was a matching network video or the traps, you had a spool of wire suspended, I think at roughly the height of one of your poles, and you had an antenna analyzer at the BNC connector, and you were unspooling wire from the pole to figure out when you got um, a good match at the antenna analyzer for whatever frequency to figure out the length of the wire. If you cut that wire at that point, is that really what you get? Or is there an effect due to all that spooled up wire sitting at the end? There, there's certainly an effect, but, um, and it's, it's dependent on the, the diameter of the spool and the thickness of the insulation of the wire. Those are kind of two of the key factors that I've found. And if you've got a much larger spool or wire with uh, thicker insulation on it, you get less capacitive coupling in that spool of the wire to itself, and it acts more like wire and less like less just like a blob. So, um, so that wire that I was doing that with is uh, 30 gauge wrapping wire, um, which has a very thin uh, insulating sheath on it, and the spool itself. Uh, I don't think I have one sitting here, but the spool itself is is you know only maybe two inches in diameter. So. So that wire has very little impact. Now, if I bring the spool of poly stealth out and do the same thing, it has a bit more of an impact. So what I end up having to do is before I cut it, I pull off another meter or two of wire um, and then trim to resonance. So, so you certainly have to be a little bit cautious of that because uh, although it doesn't have a huge impact, it certainly does have some impact. We you mentioned the trick that you do with uh, coiling up the end. I found that that's very effective. A lot of times you can make that last little bit of the wire when you're in the field disappear without having to destroy it for future. So I've always got a little like clump at the end of my wire that I'm playing around with in the field. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, you, you don't even have to coil it up. You can just fold it back on itself and make sure it's, it's real close together. I tend to to kind of twist it a little bit so it, it holds itself together that way and then either put a little piece of tape on it or um, 
the other option is to just have a little uh, like uh, insulator with three or four holes in it that you can slide up and down the wire. Um, and then just if you put it under enough tension, it, it pulls those wires together and gets them pretty close. So yeah, good, uh, good tip for sure. All right, let's uh, look at a few more antennas here. So um, this is a six element two meter Yagi that I built out of uh, aluminum arrow shafts for the uh, elements and fiberglass arrow shafts for the boom. And it is a fairly rickety little thing, <laughs> but <laughs> it, uh, it holds up well enough. It's quite light. And uh, this was my, my first outing with it. And on this outing, I made three VHF contact, contacts over 300 miles. So um, pretty, uh, pretty incredible range. Um, I think probably some tropospheric ducting because it was certainly beyond line of sight uh, out to some other stations in, in Arizona. Um, I intend to rebuild that one with um, an aluminum C-channel uh, folding boom that will be a, a little more sturdy and, and uh, hold up better for, for portable operations. Um, I also have uh, in work a 16-foot uh, boom version of that with nine elements um, that I intend to take out portable. And uh, at some point, I will probably attempt to make an EME contact from a soda summit <laughs> with that just because <laughs> it might actually be possible. So. You what don't is, know if um, you don't try. <laughs> what's an EME contact? Earth, Moon, Earth. So basically, oh, you okay. uh, you point you point your uh, your high gain antenna at uh, the moon, which is not very reflective of RF, and then hope someone else with a much larger station than I will have uh, is listening on the other end to um, uh, a very sensitive weak signal mode. I think JT sixty five is probably the most common digital weak signal mode that's used and uh, perhaps get lucky and make a contact. But uh, I've never made it, never even attempted an EME contact, but um, I think it would be uh, uh, ridiculous and fun to do it from a soda summit. And you can be sure I'll have a camera rolling for that one. <laughs> what sort of power, would you go to hundred Watts for that? So that, that's another thing I would need to do. Um, I, I will, if I do attempt, if or when I do attempt, I'll say when, when I do attempt that, I will likely um, end up with an, an amplifier and a, a receive preamp um, because I, I think that's going to be key for success on that. So, so this is uh, another fun little antenna that I, I built. Um, I wanted to, to, get into satellite uh, work for, for summits on the air. Uh, satellites are the only repeaters you can use for summits on the air activity. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the arrow beam antennas and the, um, oh, what's the other one? Uh, the log periodics elk antenna are the two real common ones uh, people use. And I decided, well, I'm going to try to build my own. And a, a friend, another YouTuber, um, came up with a, a, a two element design that actually was resonant on um, two meters and 70 centimeters. And uh, he, he was telling me about it. I was like, oh, that, I don't know that that'll work. Uh, let me model it up in, in MMA and A and see what it looks like. And it actually had a, a decent pattern. So I started tinkering around some more and came up with this design. It's a three element design. Uh, oh, roughly a, a 12 inch or long, so uh, thir I think 13 inches from the rear element to the front element. And it actually has no reflector on it. it. The driven element is the rear element and the two front parasitic elements are, are shorter, so they'd be considered directors. Um, and in my antenna modeling, I found that it gave me uh, a good match on both two meters in the, the lower portion of the band where the satellites hang out and all, also on 70 centimeters. Um, so I get about 5.3 dBD of forward gain. It doesn't have much rear rejection, but I don't really care much about rejection off the back. I just want some forward gain to, to be able to hear or reach the satellite. 
And on 70 centimeters, of course, it's got a couple of lobes off at 45 degrees, but I still get about 4.8 dBd of forward gain on 70 centimeters. And um, the whole thing weighs 5.6 ounces, uh, so extremely light. And it breaks down and packs up quite small. I've, I've since added a, a little common mode choke to the feed point there. Um, and it's a heck of a lot of fun to use. I don't know if, uh, if any of you are into satellite contacts, but uh, quite, quite an adventure to, to play around with that, particularly on a summit. Any, any questions about that antenna? I was going to ask about the previous one and how that breaks down. I assume it's fairly similar to this, though. Mm -hmm. cool. Yeah, very, very similar. Um, so these are uh, threaded, threaded rods that go through uh, the, the boom arrow shaft. And then I've got some nylon spacers that I drilled sideways through. And there's a build video for this one. Um, it's, uh, it's kind of, uh, it's more cinematic than it is uh, educational, but um, with a little, you know, watching through it a few times, you can certainly figure out how I build it. And I've got, uh, I think I put the MMANA file in the, the description on that one, if you're curious about it. Um, but yeah, threaded rods, the, um, if you do intend to build an antenna out of aero shafts like this, you, um, one thing you need to do is remove the anodized coating from the inside of the antenna before you crimp that little insert into place, because the anodized coating is not very conductive and uh, you're not going to get good electrical contact um, if you just crimp it on in. So, How do you so, find that out? Uh, so I found that out when I built one of my loop antennas. So one of my first loop antennas, before I built that one with the bar stock, I came up with the idea to use a tent pole, a collapsible tent pole as the, the hoop for, the, for a, a small transmitting loop antenna. I, um, my, my goal was to come up with a design, a self-supporting uh, outer loop design that didn't require a frame, but was still collapsible. And um, that tent pole design, actually, I've got some of them sitting right here. It's a little out of my reach. But um, that tent pole design uh, worked pretty well. And when I first built that, uh, the, the way the tent poles were built with the ferrules, the little smaller tubing that slips into the larger tubing, um, those had been uh, punched into place with the anodized coating on. So I built it, and I was like, why doesn't this thing work? And then I metered it with the, the multimeter and I was like, oh. <laughs> so my solution to that one was uh, relatively simple and probably not the most electrically efficient, but I, I drilled a couple of holes sideways through each of those tubes and then just put aluminum pop rivets in there to give it uh, some, some electrical contact. And, and that worked pretty good on, on, on that one. Given that you fish so much in your videos, I'm, I'm really wondering why you haven't figured out a way to um, make the uh, antenna um, out of your fishing pole and, and just string <laughs> wire instead of filament through your, your fishing pole. Well, you know, the most of those poles that I use are actually sold as fishing poles. They're sold as a, a tenkata type fishing pole, a uh, Japanese style of fly fishing. Um, so I've, I've repurposed those poles <laughs> to use for, uh, for my antenna masts. But, uh, but yeah, I, I, um, I actually have used uh, my fly fishing pole to hold up uh, a wire antenna on a summit before. <laughs> so <laughs> I have been there. Ad, been Adam, there I, had a, I had a question about the pole, the fishing poles. Yeah. Have you noticed the difference in the so-called high carb, the carbon fiber ones versus the fiberglass ones? And have you found a reliable way to even tell whether it truly is carbon fiber when you do order one? Um, I, I don't know a reliable way uh, to tell for the, the cheaper Chinese ones. Um, what I will say is that I, for a lot of them, I prefer the fiberglass just for its durability. Um, for my, my smaller super ultralight ones, I, I get the carbon fiber ones, but, um, but uh, generally speaking, um, if I'm okay with a little bit of extra weight, I, I do like the fiberglass, um, especially if I'm going to be running a vertical antenna where the wire is running parallel to the, the, the mast. Um, the carbon fiber ones interact much more electrically with uh, the antenna than the fiberglass ones do. Yeah, I've been trying to avoid those, but it's been getting harder and harder to tell when you're ordering them yeah. now. 
and I, I think I think sometimes they're they're advertising carbon fiber when it's not even carbon fiber, which makes it even more difficult for me because they think that's a positive and I think it's a negative. Yeah. Yeah, and then some of the fiberglass ones. Um, let's see here. I'll go back and uh, let's see the um, the ones with the 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 four with the white stripes on them, <clears throat> and also the four Cabela's ones in the middle. Um, those are actually all fiberglass ones, even though they're black. So the 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 color is not an indicator either. Um, so. Uh, while, while we're looking at these, I, I got to throw out a couple tips for those of you that use these, um, these telescopic poles. Number one, uh, the cap that comes with it, leash the cap to the pole. You're going to thank yourself later for that uh, because you, you can always tell the, the newer soda operators that have, um, that have poles with, with no caps on them because they haven't leashed their caps <laughs> and they go through the brush and it knocks it off and it's long gone. So leash your caps, just drill a little hole in it, put a piece of cord in it, and then uh, attach it to uh, the top of the pole. Where do you attach it? Well, um, I always, let's see if I can zoom in on this. I might be able to, ah, yeah, now we're talking. There we go. It's still not super high res, but you get the idea. Um, so you can see at the top of those poles, I've also made some loops of cord as guy points. Uh, to, to guide the antenna mass down. I usually put three loops on there. And um, in some cases, I've just put some like duct tape or stronger tape and then a piece of uh, adhesive line heat shrink tubing over it. And that seems to be sufficient. In other cases, I've wrapped cord over top of the other cord uh, pretty tightly and then epoxied that into place. Um, and, and that just makes, uh, and then in a, on a third one here, um, I just use a, a hose clamp to, to hold them in, in place. And that works pretty good too. Nice, quick, easy uh, adaptation there. Um, the other thing I like to do on the smaller poles, um, this ultralight ones is, it's a little hard to tell, but I put heat shrink tubing on the outside of the pole so I can just cram it into the rocks, you know, on the ground and, and prop it up that way and not have to worry about damaging the pole. So some good tips there. And then the last thing I'll say on, on those poles, especially the, the lighter weight fishing poles, is that that, that tip section is super thin. <clears throat> and initially, I would take that out and just throw it away because it was too light for to be useful. But what I've learned is that rather than throwing it away, I pull it out, coat it with epoxy, and then stick it into that second section, uh, but not extended and just glue it into that, what is now the, the, the last tip section of the pole. And it adds some strength and reinforces it uh, so it's less likely to break. The other thing I do in that process is that little piece of cord that comes off the end of that thin tip is that I, I pull a loop of it out and have that glued into place. So that loop becomes my attach point for a little plastic S clip to clip my wire to. So Adam, I found out one other tip over the years yeah always keep a pair of dishwashing pot rubber gloves with you it'll help when you have, can't get one to come apart if you can grab it with two rubber gloves and twist it you can get them to go back in when they don't want to come apart that is brilliant love it <laughs> so um I, I know we're at about an hour here now i've got uh, a few more photos here um i want to talk a little bit about some of the other projects i do some mint tin radios this one is a uh, <clears throat> the uh, Chinese version of the rock mite that I crammed into an Altoid tin. Had to do a little bit of trimming on that one, but it makes for uh, quite a nice fit. Um, if you're interested in building that one, look up the, uh, the, the rock mite on the, you know, Amazon or, or AliExpress, the various uh, uh, websites where you can find the Chinese random goodies. Um, here's a slew of my, uh, my mint tin radios, the original rock mite on the upper left with uh, a battery USB charger, voltage step up regulator and a capacitive touch key. Um, that's featured in one of my videos. Um, and then a, a 49er on the bottom center. And then a slew of pixies on the right hand side. And uh, you might be thinking, those look a little small for pixies. And they are. Oh, there's one of my other <laughs> antennas. We'll come to, back to that in a minute. Um, those are actually 
Altoid Smalls tins. Those are not full-size Altoids tins, but the ones that are about a third of the size of the full-size Altoids tin. And let's see, here we go. There is the standard Pixie transceiver board. For those of you that aren't familiar with the Pixie, it's um, probably one of the simplest uh, HF single frequency CW transceivers in existence. Um, it's a very poor performer, but um, a very simple design and kind of creative design using transistors in, uh, in multiple functions in there. But um, what I discovered is that you can actually cut off about a third of the Pixie board and the Pixie still works. Um, so, so that's what I did. And I crammed it into this Altoid Smalls tin. Uh, there is a, a battery, uh, actually three small LiPo batteries underneath that circuit board. And, um, a small SMA connector, a charging port on the end, and a headphone jack on the front of the unit. And uh, so you can see the, the white contact switch kind of up toward the, the top of the board there. That's actually not the Morse code key on this unit. Uh, that switch is what turns the radio on and off. And when you close the lid, it opens the switch and turns the radio off. When you open the lid, it closes the switch and turns the radio on. This copper wire uh, connected on the left side of the board over to the potentiometer there is actually the straight key. And when you press down on the end of it, it grounds out to the crystal case and uh, switches you into transmit mode. So uh, this, uh, this rig, um, <clears throat> I have a video where I did a soda activation with this. The whole station weighed about 1.7 ounces, I think, for, uh, for the entire station, including the antenna. But that wasn't small enough, so I decided to go smaller. <laughs> so this is that same board, about two inches by two inches on the left, and a what I call micro pixie, uh, also known as the choking hazard. Uh, on the bottom right there. Um, it's, it's essentially just a surface mount device version of the Pixie uh, that I, I sketched up in uh, Auto, Autodesk Eagle. Um, went through a few iterations of failures and then uh, finally came up with one that works. <clears throat> and uh, that's it next to an Anderson power pole connector, which uh, gives you a good, uh, good idea of scale. And that's your standard you know, 20 or 30 amp uh, Anderson power pole. So there is also a, a fun video of a soda activation using that transceiver. And I, I wanna say I made about 17 contacts on that activation with this little thing. It, it puts out about 850 milliwatts. So it's actually a little more powerful than your, uh, your standard Pixie. Um, the, uh, the pins on the bottom left there are the antenna jack. It's just a couple of header pins. And the, um, the antenna that I use with this is an FT20. Dash 43 toroid wound as a NFED half wave transformer and 66 or so feet of wire. So, this is another recent project. Um, uh, US Penny with um, this is a capacitive touch key circuit. Um, I had previously purchased some of these capacitive touch keys from a seller in, in Ukraine, but they're quite expensive and um, and I said, you know what, uh, there's circuit diagrams online. I can make this and I can make it smaller. So, um, so this was a, a fun little recent build. This is, uh, I don't know if the video will play for you, but um, this is my heavily modified mountain topper, MTR3B. Are you able to get any sound out of that or is it? Yeah, okay. It's not going to transmit the sound to you. PW. But um, so those are those are capacitive touch points, uh, those cap nuts, stainless steel cap nuts, and I crammed a capacitive touch circuit inside of this. Um, just above my left thumb there is a speaker, so I added a, a speaker and small audio amplifier, um, so uh, so I don't have to use headphones with the radio if I don't want to. And um, I also added this is the radio that I added the. Uh, the tiny SWR uh, meter too as well. This is another fun little radio. This comes from a, a guy in the Ukraine. It's a single frequency digital transceiver. 
and um, just some recent mods on this one. I added a, a, a lighted power button. There used to just be a DC jack there, um, but I added an internal battery with a USB-C port for charging. Um, and it's a 1600 milliamp hour single LiPo cell with a USB charger and then a step up voltage regulator, um, which uh, has been uh, pretty fun to use. It's, it's nice to have a little self-contained unit. You just plug in audio in and audio out. And um, I retuned it uh, to operate on FT8. So now I've got a extremely portable one and a half watt uh, FT8 rig that uh, I need to take out on a Soda Summit and film a video of. So um, another thumbnail from a fun recent video uh, from last summer trip in the Sierra with my family. If you like fishing uh, um, and like beautiful mountains, that is a fantastic video to watch. And then I think that's my last photo here, just my logo. But um, I wanted to bring this one back up. It was a little out of order. This was uh, a fun uh, experiment. Uh, the, the group of YouTubers, um, ham radio YouTubers, got together. And occasionally, we, uh, we set up a theme night. And the theme night uh, in January was Will It Antenna? And our goal was to come up with something ridiculous to build an antenna out of. So I tack welded together uh, about 40 or 42 beer cans and set it up as a 20 meter vertical in my front yard and proceeded to make a whole bunch of contacts on, on a beer can antenna. <laughs> so it's not how you're supposed um, to make a beverage antenna. <laughs> dang it. I knew I was doing it wrong. <laughs> there was a 1980s article in 73 magazine with the same thing. That's awesome. <laughs> So, um, so yeah, that's another, uh, another fun one to watch, but, um, that I think, uh, concludes my presentation here. I want to thank Vic for having me. It's been, uh, it's been a lot of fun to, to chat with you all. And, um, I, in all that I do, I, I don't monetize my channel. I have a job. I make money elsewhere. I do the video stuff for fun. Um, and, uh, I love when I get positive feedback and inspire other people. And hopefully I've done a little bit of that tonight. Hopefully some of you will get out and operate portable. Uh, perhaps, uh, I know you don't have any summits right in your area there, but uh, you, you do have some options, I'm sure, for, for parks and things like that. And uh, portable operation is, I've got a home station set up, but portable operation is a really a special thing in just how quiet everything is, you can hear everything. And if you get in a spot where you have terrain as your advantage, uh, either a high spot or um, terrain that drops away around you, your antennas will per perform incredibly out there. So um, get out there, operate portable and have some fun uh, and, uh, and make a video about it. Share your experience with others. I'm sure we'll enjoy it. Well, thank you very much, Adam. That's great. Um, I hope you've got time for a few more questions. Before we do Absolutely. that, I, I just wanted to uh, uh, acknowledge and introduce Anthony K8 Zulu Tango, uh, who asked a couple of questions. And he's, um, he's a ham radio educator. Uh, Abby and Patrick uh, attended a couple of sessions he did for the ARRL Learning Center on um, contesting. And he gives a lot of talks, probably cool. a few a week on different, all different aspects of amateur radio. So welcome, Anthony. Um, and I guess we'll open it up for questions. Uh, shout them out. I've got a couple more. The, the really tiny one, I think you called it choking hazard. Um, can you point out on that one, um, I think I could see power and uh, antenna, but you must have what well, you must be able to connect headphone or or something and a, and a key somewhere. Yeah, so I, I have to actually attach an external key to that one. Let's see. I guess I am still sharing my screen here. Let me get back. Oh, come on. Um, give me one second here back to photos let's see 
And then in case it's easier, um, the digital one, similar question, how are you getting your digital in and out of it? Yeah, so the digital in and out of that one is pretty straightforward. It's just, um, it's just audio in and audio out, uh, line, line okay. level audio in and out. Yeah, right. so quite simple. Um, here we go. This should be a little better. Right. So this, the connector up on the upper left, the, you can see the, the red and black wires. That goes to a, a battery. That's just a small battery connector. And then the four pin connector that's right on the board there has uh, the, the two pins for the key and two pins for the, the audio out. Um, the antenna is on the, the bottom there. Um, let's see here. Very cute. Yeah, so you can kind of see some some of the iterations that I went through in in working this thing out. Um, the first couple were collaborations with some friends, and then um, the the third from the right was the first successful <clears throat> board. And then I thought ah, I could make that smaller. And then I thought ah, I could make that even smaller. <laughs> so the the whole radio itself uh, weighs two point six grams. Um, pretty darn small and light. And yeah, there's a picture of the, the NFED half wave matching unit that I use with it, uh, with the 30 gauge wire on it. And um, it, uh, it handles that big old 850 milliwatts just fine. Oh, there you go. There's a picture with the, uh, the connect, a couple of connectors applied to right. uh, another, uh, another variation on it. How do you keep from dropping it and losing it? <laughs> yeah, that is the challenge. <laughs> so the, the small components on this are um, 0, 04, 0, 02 sized um, uh, parts there. So those little tiny surface mount capacitors and resistors are, are pretty small. Um, just for the heck of it, I, I recently uh, designed and had uh, Printed another board where I downsized those to zero one zero twos just to see if I could do it. I haven't tried to build it yet, but <laughs> it's, it's, it'll be fun. No, no coffee allowed on those days. <laughs> Any other questions? I think uh, these are great stocking stuffers. I, I can imagine having that Altoid one uh, 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 for Christmas presents. Just just throwing that out there. <laughs> yeah, you know, I I, I may eventually um, uh, th those I don't think are really uh, things that that people could could reasonably build as a kit. Even the zero four zero two size components are just so tightly packed in there that it, it's it's really hard to build. I'm using fine tip tweezers and solder paste and a needle to put the solder paste on and then hot air to, to melt everything. Um, but, um, but I, I may at some point just have, you know, a batch manufactured and, and sell them for, you know, roughly what they cost to, to get them out there and have people have some fun. So. Adam, I'm interested in that satellite antenna uh, that you had there. Were, were they actually arrows as in bow and arrow kind of elements or what, what does that, what was that? Yes, they are actually arrow shafts and, and I order the, the cheapest aluminum ones I can find either on Amazon or like AliExpress. And <clears throat> they, um, they, they, they're great material to build antennas out of. They're super light, they're pretty strong. And then um, I just crimp those inserts into place with, uh, you know, standard uh, coax crimp, nothing special. Um, I find that it uh, slightly over crimps them. So um, I actually end up having to uh, re-drill the counter bore um, and then re-tap the threads because they get a little bit compressed. Um, but uh, but it, it does work work pretty well. Yeah, I'm definitely gonna have to have a look at that. I built uh, Dave Tadlock's uh, $4 coat hanger uh, satellite antenna. It worked relatively well. But it's heavy yeah. and it's long, and I really like the uh, short lightness of yours. So I'm going to definitely give that a look. Thanks yeah, for it's it, it's um, you know, it's it's obviously not optimized for performance, being a, a dual bander with using the same elements for two meters and seventy centimeters. It's the the radiation pattern. Let's see, I might even have a, a picture of it. Um, let's see. Yeah, there it is. Bring this up. 
Um, I think I have a picture of the radiation pattern on here. Uh, yeah, let's do this. Let's go back to screen share. And um, let's see, which one is it? Got to find the right page. There it is. Let me know when you can see the pattern there. So that's actually, that's the two meter radiation pattern. You can see there's a massive lobe off, off the back. It's, it's certainly not optimized as a, a you know, a, a Yagi for two meters, but I'm running five Watts. I'm not worried about, you know, a little bit of radiation coming back at me. Um, and I still get 5.2 DBD of forward gain out of it. So it's, it's functional. It's, it's effective, you know, in, in sending RF where I want it to go. Um, there it is in testing. Let's see here. So here's the 70 centimeter pattern. And you can see that it has a 5.7 dBD lobe at about 45 degrees. But I don't really care about that. Um, what I care about is that I at least have some forward gain. And I still get, I, I want to say it's about, oh, um, let's see. What does it tell me? Um, does it tell me? Maybe it's not in this photo, but I want to say it's about 4.8 or 5 dB of DBD of forward gain on 70 centimeters. It's a narrower lobe because of the lobes off to the side. So I have to make sure I point it well, um, but it, it's light, it packs small, it's easy to use and it, it works well enough. So, um, so yeah, you know, if you're serious about sats, get, a, get an arrow that's got what, six or seven elements on 70 centimeters and three on two meters, and you're gonna have better luck. It's gonna be a better performer. But, um, but for something that's super light and portable and, uh, and works well enough, this, this is a pretty cool design. Could you step back to that picture where you were standing with it in the field? That one there? Yes, yes. Yeah. I just wanted to cap capture that. That's, uh, that's, that's a really slick, slick device. Yeah, and and the you know the other thing, the other nice thing. Oh, and here are the SWR plots on the the Nano VNA. Uh, one point two to one uh, SWR um, at uh, let's see, that's at one forty six megahertz, um, and then uh, at four thirty eight, it's about one to one SWR. So. Um, so it, it, it does pretty good, just like most Yaggies, it's got a, you know, a, a significant increase as you go up in frequency. So you gotta, you gotta tune it pretty well, but, um, Are does. your parasitic elements, um, electrically attached to the boom? They, uh, yeah, I think they, they technically are. Um, I didn't necessarily purposefully build them that way, but, um, they're on a, an aluminum threaded rod that uh, goes through uh, almost an, an interference fit hole in, in the boom. So, um, you know, that there's, they're most likely in contact with the boom. I use a nylon threaded rod for the, the driven elements at the back. So they're obviously not conductive to the boom uh, or to each other. Um, and then uh, the feed line just attaches to those. Thanks. Super, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm gonna, let's see, I'll double check um, and make sure that uh, I actually do have that um, MMANA file and the details in the, the video for that one. Any other questions from anyone? So I've got a question about which bands on HF you spend how much time on when you're doing soda activations? Like you mentioned 30 meters. Is that a big soda band? You know, it, clearly you've been on 10 with the Yagi and, and 15 with the Bobtail, but where do you, you know, and, and where do you want to be? Yeah, so mo most most uh, soda activators are operating on 20 and 40. Those are by far the most popular bands. Um, I recently modified my mountain topper. Uh, I actually have three mountain topper MTR 3Bs, <laughs> but I recently modified the one that has all the modifications already. 
and swapped out the 30 meter band for 17 meters. Um, uh, fortunately, those, those older radios from LNR Precision had the old Steve Weber firmware in them uh, for a couple of other bands, 80 meters and uh, 17 meters. So, um, so I, I tested it out um, with a resistor across a couple of uh, solder pads and confirmed that it had 17 meters built into the chip. And then once I confirmed that, I swapped out capacitors. So now um, with that rig, I use 17, 20, and 40. 30 meters is nice, and 17 meters is also nice on contest weekends to get away from the contest traffic if you want to. Um, but uh, but yeah, most of the soda activity is on 17, I'm sorry, 20 and 40. And then uh, I really like working 17 and 15 just to get some DX in the log. It's a lot of fun. What's uh, the contact that you're most proud of on your homebrew equipment? Oh, let's see. Well, uh, one that stands out would be that 328 mile contact um, on, on two meters. That was pretty awesome. Uh, let's see, what else? Um, I think that that activation I showed the map of uh, where I had uh, an excellent opening on 20 into Australia. Um, that was one of my, my longest contact ever to Perth, Australia. I think it's 9,000 miles or so uh, was, was on that activation. Um, and it happened to be a single sideband contact. It wasn't even on CW and the, the propagation path was so good. We were just able to chat and rag chew with, uh, with no issue understanding each other. That was pretty cool. Um, the HF contact, I think I'm most proud of was a summit to summit contact to uh, a guy in New Zealand, um, Zulu Lima one, Bravo Yankee Zulu, ZL1BYZ, John, uh, who is a, a regular soda chaser from his home station. He's got an incredible like contest caliber station down there. And even when I'm running, you know, QRP power levels, he's, he's making contact with me. But he was out on a soda summit running 10 watts from a KX2, and I was able to, to make a summit to summit contact with him on CW. Um, I gave him uh, a 119 signal report, and um, I think if it weren't for his skill in operating and being able to methodically and, and repeatedly send his call sign at the right times, um, and uh, be able to pull me out of the noise. He sent me a 229 signal report and I was running hundred watts. Um, that, that was probably one of my, my most proud uh, contacts. And I, I wish I had a recording of that thing because I'm sure I would go back and listen to it and think, I don't know how the heck I was able to pull his, his call sign and signal report out of that because it was such a, a, a weak signal. That was a good one. So when you make a YouTube video of an activation or some other portable activity, um, how much planning have you put into it? I mean, I, I guess I've seen the video where you talk about recording the audio on the Sony recorder and so on, but I kind of wonder like how much footage winds up on the floor? Um, how do you know what's gonna happen and what you're trying to accomplish in the video? Is it for you just like a diary of what you did while you were there? It, it mostly is. Um, I, I generally put more thought and planning into you know, the videos I film at home. Um, and uh, the amount of footage that ends up on the cutting room floor varies significantly depending on how much I end up actually filming. Uh, sometimes, you know, I'm, I'm uh, able to multitask and more into making a, a, a video. And other times I'm like, I just want to operate. I'll hit the, the record button and go operate. And there are certainly activations where I film some video. And at some point during the day, I was like, ah, forget it. I'm, I'm over it for today. <laughs> and it just doesn't happen. Um, but, um, but yeah, there, the, I think one of the important things to understand uh, if or when you start making videos is that 
it's okay to throw away a whole bunch of footage. You, you got to pull out those nuggets and those gems um, that make for good video. And um, it takes a surprisingly small time frame of video to convey a message. Uh, you don't need typically a long uh, video to, 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 you know, make something fun and artistic. And in fact, uh, oftentimes a shorter clip or shorter segment uh, makes for a much better video. Um, as you could probably tell in, in some of my, my more recent videos, I, I really enjoy the art of, of making a video. And um, I'm constantly trying to learn and improve my skills in that art. Um, and I have a lot of fun doing it. Uh, the, the other th the last thing I think I'll say on that is, is that um, editing takes a lot of time. It's a tremendous amount of work to, <laughs> to go through and edit video footage into a, a, a fun video. And um, uh, I wish I had more time to do it. And uh, at, at some point I will. But uh, in the meantime, um, I'm still generally able to get a video out every couple of weeks, and uh, and that that seems to be uh, that seems to be pretty good. Comment and, and a question. Mm -hmm. uh, it's Roger here. Um, in terms of videos, I if you you do, you they're good. They're great. Um, I have a I, my other hobby is geocaching, and I have a friend that does a blog. And he's doing really well too. And I and you can see I know how much work he puts into it. So I can see how much you are putting into it. Some yeah. of the shots, for instance, where you're walking up the hill and you and you're you know, the camera's watching you walk up the hill. But people don't realize you had to walk up the hill twice. You go up, put the camera down, you go back, you come across the camera, and you go back and pick up the camera, and then you go up the hill again. It's like twice as much work to do all and i noticed that with him and i go my god you must walk the trails twice as long as we do and he goes yeah well, more or less um the other question back to the two meter um the long contact the antenna was vertical so was that fm or ssb um, so i uh in the in the photo it was vertical i i also oriented it uh horizontal for some some of the contacts um the 328 mile contact I made both on FM and on CW. Um, okay. And my, I, I knew the guy at the other end was running a vertical antenna. So I left it vertical for, for CW. Okay. Okay. I, I do a, a VHF and Rover and stuff and we're vertical or horizontal for SSB and right. vertical for FM. So I was just wondering, okay, cool. Yeah. So in the, the ARRL VHF contest recently, um, I, I ran as a three band station from a local summit. I made about a hundred and I think 143 contacts in, uh, in about five and a half hours of operation. So pretty, pretty decent. Um, and I, I have a portable three element, six meter beam that I built with another one of those geared motor rotators. And I stacked that my little satellite antenna on top of it. So I had a horizontally polarized two meter, 70 centimeter, uh, antenna um, on a rotator. And then I had a couple of um, omnidirectional uh, verticals that I was using primarily for, for FM stuff. Yeah, yeah, I watched that, but I was, that was quite impressive. I watched that when I liked it. I got yeah, about, I think I got about 10 cues in that contest because I'm stuck at home and didn't, didn't go out with the rover yeah. mobile and all that crap. So, I, but yeah, good, good job. Yeah, I, I was kind of cheating in that because I was on a, a decently high summit that has decent view shed of, of like all of Southern California, San Diego County, Orange County, LA County, Summer Riverside. So um, there, there's a huge, you know, huge population centers there. And I was on a 6,500 foot mountaintop. So, <laughs> so it worked out pretty well. Um, and another kind of funny, I was chuckling when you were mentioning the hiking up the hill and, and coming back and getting your camera. Um, I, I just uh, did winter field day and uh, because we actually had a, a, a little dose of old man winter in uh, Southern California here, I took the skis out and used my Alpine touring skis, skis to go up um, uh, that summit. And I, I did that a number of times. And as I was doing it, each time I was thinking, this is like five times the, the pain in the butt as it is just on foot because turning around on skis, you know, you, you got to do your kick turn, get your ski around, get your other ski around, skin back down, and then turn around again to get back up the hill. <laughs> so, yes, I, I feel the pain on that. <laughs> uh, 
Very good. Thank you. Back to you, Vic. Anyone else? I think I just wanted to mention that I put a link in the chat for people with my slide, um, links to my presentations if you're interested. Cool. And, and and Adam, I really appreciate your, your your fine editing. I've just never been able to get the time to do that. So I'm one of these people that I in my job before one of my things was teaching um, was training teachers on using technology in the classroom. And my cool. partner and I decided very early that we were not going to edit anything. So we ran everything live so we wouldn't have to go through the hours and hours of tedious editing or we would have never gotten any content out. So I appreciate people like you that can spend the time and do that. I just never had the patience for it. Nice. Well, thank you. Oh, and every time I watch your video when you're when you're modifying that uh, connector, I always think I'm always afraid you're going to cut your finger with that rotary tool. So, Please use a vice but, when you do that. <laughs> so that, but but that 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 bit that's on there is it's actually a diamond bit. Yeah. And you can touch your finger with that. Oh, okay. And it, it doesn't hurt you. Yeah. It's um. It's it's kind of nice in that way. <laughs> it's scary when you're watching it for the first time. I'm sure. <laughs> This is how you can tell the mechanical engineers from the electrical engineers. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, thank you very much, Anthony, for the link. But also, thank you very much, Adam. This has been a great presentation. Yes. It's our first external presentation during Zoom times. And cool. you've been um, very entertaining, thought provoking. I think a lot of us have gone away with some things that we want to try, like um, the idea of the little spindly top telescoping section, gluing it to the second one. It, like your talk was just full of hints for things to do. And um, I think we'll be doing a lot more portable stuff after this. So thank cool. you very much. Um, and I'm gonna look forward to seeing your next videos and what you get up to in the future so thanks so awesome. much well thanks for having me i really appreciate it thank you adam uh thank you very much it was uh entertaining informative you have a lot of fans up here and we'll keep watching those videos and and enjoy making note of your your tips i especially like the mini traps I caught my yeah. very interesting thank you i never I went there without seeing you tonight. So uh, definitely we'll apply what we've learned here tonight. And Vic, thanks for bringing on the international presentation. Uh, I think we even have, uh, we have Australia coming up. I'm pretty sure uh, we'll, we'll see more international presentations at the club. And I'll, I'll just make sure everyone realizes you don't have to live in Kitchener Waterloo to be a member. If you want to be a member and you live in Australia, if you live in San Diego, if you live in Alaska, come on in, uh, especially New Orleans. we got to have more New Orleans representation here at Kitchen Wireless Amateur Radio Club. Uh, I'd, I'd really like that. So thank you very much, everyone, for showing up and excellent presentation. Jonathan, what was our tally tonight? Well, how many people did we have here? Uh, I think we peaked out around 37 at the high 37. Point. Yeah. Very good. Okay. Thank you very much. And if there's no other business, anyone have anything they want to bring up uh, that needs to be discussed as far as club business? I don't hear anything, no hands waving, or though I may not see everybody. Okay. Well, there. that's a wrap, as we say in the video business. That's a wrap. Thank you very much, Adam. Please come again. Sounds good. Thank you. 7 3, everybody. Thank 73. 73. 7 3, Adam. Thanks, all. We'll, we'll keep you inviting you, right Adam, even when you're not speaking. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. 7 3. 7 to 3, all. Seven three. Good night, everyone. Thank, thanks for showing up, Andrew. Great to see you. Yeah, yeah, thanks. It's good to see everyone. You done yeah. any more contacts since that one with me? 
Uh, no, not yet. I, I okay. want to. I want to get on the net. Yeah, that'd be great. I'll try, try I, make. I, let's see, see if my HT can hit it. Yeah, unfortunately tonight we didn't do the net, but next week is Harry's gonna do the net and the the other net after the net thing. We'll see. Maybe I'll try and connect next great. week. Cool. Great. Okay. Good night, everyone. Good night, guys. Yeah, we need to work out. Uh... A really interesting presentation from Anthony's list uh, and invite him for a, a talk in the next few months. That would be great. You do so much to um, turn people on to new topics, Anthony. Well, the one thing I wanted to mention is I just actually the meeting I was at earlier tonight is the Rat Pack group. And I'm not sure if you guys are aware of them, but they're doing a, a session every Wednesday and Thursday night. Thursday nights are oriented towards uh, emergency communication and SECs, uh, but Wednesday nights are general topics. And there's a link in my uh, my page there of links uh, for their schedule. Um, they've been very busy doing things. And for those of you that were in the class with me, um, they still haven't gotten around to getting things squared away at the, at the, uh, the ARRL, so they haven't rolled the class out to the public. So you're still the only ones that have taken it. So I'm glad you, at least we got to do that. That was a lot of fun doing it that way. Anthony, could you send that again? I had to get off air there for a minute and I yes. missed it. I came back. It was going. Yes, on. I'd be happy to do that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and I'll make sure uh, I have it by email, Maureen. I'll make sure I send oh, okay. it to the okay. CW group too. So, yeah. All right. There you go. It's tiny.cc slash k8zt p. Okay. Well, P for presentations, not for portable. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks very much, everybody. This worked really well. It's our first external and kind of first um, invitation of uh, people who aren't right from around here to the club. And that seemed to just work out real well. So see you all soon. Okay, everybody take it easy. I'm out of here. Have a good night. We'll see you tomorrow. Yeah, I'll see you tomorrow, Maureen. Make a couple of contacts on that SACC. Excellent. Uh, where, where? Found one of my pages. <laughs> yeah, right. I made a Nova Scotia. Now, yeah, Lockport, Nova Scotia with Ben. I got a 5.9 from him. Wow. And he did good coffee. And uh, WITAG Rick from South Holden, Massachusetts. And then there was another one I couldn't, I, uh, the faded out on us, W2ITT Rob. It faded out so I couldn't get back to him. Okay. Well, that's good. That's good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. I better get out of here. It's past my bedtime. Okay. Care, I'll see you tomorrow night. Okay. Mm, Wonderful. Bye for now.